Right. So today we're going to look at the multiple choice section. So this is the AS paper one for AQA. Right. And so ooh, today we're going to look at the multiple. I'm echoey, sorry. Um, so we're going to look at the multiple choice section. It's AQA paper one is the 20, 2018 AS paper and it's the multiple choice. So you may try these, they're on the website, but you only get given A, B, C, so on as the letters. So I thought it'd be a good idea to go through these as maybe the mark schemes doesn't necessarily help you figure out where you've gone wrong. So question 10, which is the first multiple choice question. We've got which row shows the bonding in ammonium chloride? So let's think of ammonium chloride. So that's, we've got ammonia, which is NH, and we've got the chloride. So when we look at that, what we know is that we have here, we've got covalent bonds. So we've got three covalent bonds between the N and the H's. We've also got a lone pair here. This is positive, this is negative. So we've also got an ionic bond. And we also have from here to here, we have a dative covalent. So it's one of the strange ones. It's a bit mean as the first question, to be honest, but it's gonna be all three. So the answer here is C. Right, the next question. The next question asks, how many protons are there in six grams of nitrogen gas? So, oh, I don't know why you've got my emails. Close that, sorry about that. So in nitrogen gas, hopefully all you can see is this. Okay, so in nitrogen gas, you've got, so how many protons are there in six grams of nitrogen gas. So let's think about it. What do we know nitrogen is? So if we look at that, we can first say, if we look at our periodic table, so I'm gonna open up the periodic table, we're gonna look up nitrogen, and what we'll see as nitrogen on our periodic table is seven. So we've got seven on our periodic table for nitrogen. So, but remember nitrogen gas is N2. So we're gonna have N2, so our MR is gonna be 14. So first we're gonna work out our number of moles. So moles is gonna be mass over MR. So we've got six over nitrogen gas, sorry, is gonna be 28, because one is 14, so we've got two is 28. So we've got six over 28, so we get 0 0.214 moles of N2. And then if we do 0.214 moles, we're multiplying by the Avogadro constant. That tells us the number of molecules. So we get 1.29 times 10 to the 23, and that's going to be the number of molecules. But we want to know the number of protons, which is what I was saying originally. N nitrogen has seven protons, so N2 has 14 protons. So each molecule has 14 protons. We're gonna multiply this by 14 and we get 1.806 times 10 to the 24, which we can see again matches up with C. So as opposed to the number of molecules, we're looking at the number of protons. So again, be really clear what the question's asking you. Right, next one. So the diagram shows period three elements and how they vary across the period. Let me move my face out the way. Yeah. So we, what is the property that this is testing or looking at? So we can see that the property, there seems to be, we've got sodium, magnesium, sodium and magnesium, aluminium. What do we know about all of these? These are all metallic. Um, this will be still simple covalent. And then we can see we've got a spike here where we've got a giant covalent. So hopefully you recognize the spike happens to do with the bonding, which tells you about the melting point because the silicon is going to have a much higher melting point. So that's looking at your how that varies. 
Okay. 30 centimeters cubed sample of nitrogen reacted with 60 centimeters of fluorine with this equation, right? We're looking all at gases. So bear that in mind. To make life easier and to get my ratios, I'm gonna multiply everything by two. So I've got N2 plus three F2 goes to two NF3. So I can see my ratio is one to three to two. Right, so what am I told? I'm told I've got 30 centimeters cubed of nitrogen. So we've got to figure out which one is our limiting reactant. By that I mean, if we've got 30 centimeters cubed of nitrogen, that would mean we need how much fluorine would we need? So if we had 30 centimeters cubed of nitrogen to react all the nitrogen, we would need three times as much. So we'd need 30 times three, which would be um, 90. So nitrogen is not our limiting reactant. It must be fluorine. So we've got to go the other way around. So 30 centimeters cubed of 90, which we don't have enough of. So we say, okay, if we've got 60 centimeters cubed of fluorine, how much nitrogen do we need to react with the whole lot? So the ratio is one to three, we divide that by three, so we need 20 centimetres cubed of nitrogen. So now we know we've got 20 centimetres cubed of nitrogen that we've used, we've reacted it with 60 centimetres cubed of fluorine, and we're going to make 40 centimetres cubed of NF3 because of the ratio one to two. However, we still have, because we had 30 to start with, 10 centimeters cubed of nitrogen sort of floating around. So if you like, 40 plus the 10 is gonna give you 50. So that's how much you've got left at the end. So that one you've got to look at your limiting reactant, your gas laws. All right. Which substance is used to reduce titanium chloride in the interaction? So this is just one of the things that you need to know. It's magnesium. The formula is magnesium plus titanium fluorochloride gives you magnesium chloride and titanium. And to balance it, you would do that. So that's one of the equations you need to know. Right, barium sulfate. Which of the statement is correct? Now, I don't know whether you've heard of a barium meal, which it is used in medicine. It's kind of, you put it down and you can like, they can take x-rays and they can see it go down. But anyway, it's used in medicine, doesn't dissolve any blue, blood, uh, body fluids. So that's B. Which statement is correct about the reaction between concentrated sulfuric acid and sodium bromide? Okay. So bromide ions are reduced. Well, we know that's not true. Um, let's think about the equation actually. Let's, let's have a look. So we've got sulfuric acid and we've got sodium bromide. So that's gonna, that gives us, so that's gonna give us NaHSO4 plus HBr. Now this HBr, can also react with any sulfuric acid. Br, and that gives you bromine, SO2, and H2O. So those are your equations. So we can see that your bromide ions are not reduced. Hydrogen bromide and sulfur are formed. Um, so you have either hydrogen bromide, yes, you don't have hydrogen bromide and sulfur, not right. Sulfuric acid, we can see, is acting as our oxidizing agent because it's causing it to be reduced. The other way is you can eliminate everything else. So you don't get hydrogen sulfide, you get hydrogen bromide. So those sorts of things, if you're not sure, try write out the equations and then make a sensible guess. Right, indigestion. Which compound, so indigestion is when something is too acidic. 
So indigestion happens when you have excess stomach acid. So we kind of logically, you go, okay, acidic, that means I want to neutralize it. So I need something alkali. I know that hydroxide is alkali. And hopefully you'd recognize that as magnesium hydroxide, but you'd at least be able to narrow it down if you weren't sure which one it was by thinking about it needs to be alkali. So it needs to be a hydroxide. Which element has the highest first ionization energy? So we go along, we're looking at the number of protons. We think about which ones have the most protons, but then we remember this is the one with like the exception. So we would be inclined towards sulfur, but you get that repulsion in the p orbital, right? So actually it's easier than phosphorus. So phosphorus is your answer here. So this is one of the exceptions. If you don't recognize it, make sure you go back through it. Okay. A solution of 500 centimeters cubed of 150 grams of ammonia. And so concentration, we're looking at moles dm to the minus three. So straight away, I'm going, okay, that's in centimeters cubed. I'm gonna to have to divide that by a thousand to get it in dm cubed. Um, I've got 150 grams of ammonia. So I'm trying to find concentration, which is moles over volume. So first of all, I need to find my moles. So moles is the same as your mass over MR. Your mass is 150. Ammonia is NH4. So you're gonna have 17. And that gives you a number of moles, my calculator. I've got 8.824 moles. So therefore your concentration is 8.8, Eight, so concentrate 8.824 divided by this volume. So 500 over a thousand, that gives you 17.65 and the closest to it is D. So we got 17.6. Okay. Right. Okay, da, 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 da. refer to this when 20, 21, 20, 23. So we've got an experiment to find the concentration of sulfuric acid in a sample of battery acid. So we're talking about titration here. So we're titrating something, adding it slowly until we see a color change. Which suggestion would improve the chances of obtaining concordant titrates? Okay. So invert the the invert the follow invert the volumetric mass several times after adding wash the pipette, add extra. So we're trying to make sure every, all the results are the same. That's what it means. So we wanna make sure we've got as similar results as possible, taking out human error, taking out things that could go wrong. So we wanna ensure thorough mixing. And the way to do that is to invert the volumetric flask because it ensures everything is mixed and the solution, the entire solution, is the same concentration. Okay. Which suggestion about rinsing the conical flask between each titration would improve the accuracy? Now we don't want to change the concentration. We don't want to affect what's in there. So if we rinse it with water, what it will do, it will remove any of the residual moles of the acid or alkali, because that's what you're testing. So the reason that you you probably learned this anyway when you did the experiment, but the reason you rinse it with water is to remove any of those residual moles of acid and alkali. Okay, quite nice. So if you knew your titration experiment, these are quite nice because you answer all these questions when you do the practical. Which suggestion would reduce the overall measurement uncertainty in the titration? Um, so you've got use less concentrated alkali in the burette, use instead of methyl orange, use smaller samples. Um, so if we think about it, if we have less concentrated alkali, this means that the amount of acid that we add to neutralize it, right, the, the, the titrate increases. 
so, so the, sorry, the amount of alkali we add to the acid increases. So the titrate increases. So when you increase the titrate, your percentage error is going to be less. So um, we would say A, we'd use a less concentrated alkali that we're adding because that means we need to add more. Um, so your titrate increases, your numbers increase, which makes it more accurate. So it would be A in this case. Which of these is important in ensuring the student's experiment is safe? Well, uh, we're dealing acid, dealing with acid. It's very corrosive. It's going to burn. We're gonna make sure we wear gloves. So we're gonna definitely wear gloves. So it's B, we're gonna wear gloves when we're measuring out the battery acid. Right here, we're using methyl orange. It tells you that at the beginning. So we're using methyl orange and what we know about that is that methyl orange is red. That's brown, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so methyl orange we know is red in acid. And we also know that it's orange in alkali. So because we're trying to go from acid to alkali, we want to know just when it's about to be alkali or just neutralized, it's going to be B. So those are the answers. They're the multiple choice for the 2018 AQA paper. We'll go through the paper two ones, which are a little bit trickier. It's usually the calculations where you can't see your mistake and it's annoying when you can't see it. Um, so we'll go through the paper two ones um, in this week at some point as well. Um, hope that's useful and yeah, apologies for whatever happened at the beginning with